VR tape bag. Drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. When them pills try to get at you, drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. Don't leave them on the countertop. Drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. No cure for disease of addiction, but our best bet is to start with prevention. What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? You're watching the Recovery Clinic. We're live with Chris Dickey and Jimmy McGill. And something is wrong with my video on my phone. It keeps saying that I cannot view the video. So I hope other people are not experiencing that. Chris, what's up, my man? Hey, good morning. I hope you are doing well. I am uh, loving it. We're here. Recovery Clinic. Hey, real quick, Jimmy, if you can, uh, you know, the Recovery Clinic is a place for people to come and find that support and accountability uh, during this uh, time of uncertainty. Um, things are things are ever, ever evolving, ever changing. And so we wanted to create a place where people can come in at least for a short amount of time during their day to come in and be with people in the fellowship of recovery, like minded individuals turn our lives around. So real yeah. quick. Would you, would you, um, for those that may be struggling or suffering right off the bat, Jimmy, will you show the, uh, the, the support line for people? Absolutely. What was that? Did you hear that? Hey, everybody. We got Kyle Brewer, Judy Weaver. Congrats on your retirement, Judy. That's wonderful. I hope you enjoy the time in the pasture. <laughs> Uh, Brett, so glad you're here. Good morning to you, Carrie. Mm -hmm. Sherry, good morning. Who else am I missing? Anyway, um, real quick, Jimmy, uh, let's let's kind of check in with everybody. Uh, one of the things that we like to do at the beginning of the show is, uh, uh, you know, use the chat box to tell us how you're doing. Uh, how was your week? What uh, you know, with a, a, a roller coaster, um, you know, what are you doing to stay sane? What are you doing to stay peaceful? Um, work, w w did you show out a little bit? You know, what's going on? So it's a mental health check. Jimmy, what, 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 was, your week, what was your week like? Man, my week is going great. Hey, get is down. That, is that Hazel? Hazel's that's, checking in. That's Duncan checking hey, in. That's Duncan checking in. He said, hey, we're good. We're good. Yeah, you know, Duncan is such or a or or Duncan saying, "Don't out me, Jimmy. Don't out." Yeah, me. Yeah, don't tell on me. Yeah, he's he's a trip. You know what though? Uh, yeah. Those dogs are such a huge part of my recovery. Like they literally make me feel better when I'm sad. You know what I mean? Like just being able to cuddle them. Uh, I met an old uh, older gentleman yesterday when Chelsea and I were doing our taxes, and uh, he he made this. He, he was explaining to me. Uh, how the dog was the better friend than the wife. And he'd been married 45 years. He said, he was talking about how great his wife is, Chris. And he said, you know, if I lock my wife in the trunk with my dog, I can tell which one loves me the most because when I open the trunk, only one of them's going to be happy to see me. And it just made sense to me. I'm like, Hey, I get it. <laughs> that's a, that's a good barometer to see. Man, I'm doing great in my recovery and my life. Everything's good right now. I'm sick of COVID. I'm ready for it to go away. Uh, how are you doing? So I have been doing much better. I I have been getting back to the basics where I like to talk about the basics in recovery. And for me, that is going through a routine of saying some prayers in the morning and putting my priorities uh, and, and getting the, getting my priorities right. Um, I, I think I shared with everybody, uh, you know, last couple of weeks that my first priority when I woke up was checking social media and seeing what, what crazy stuff's going on in the world. And, um, and that would always spin me out and it would set a bad tone for the day. And yeah. so what I've been doing is, uh, you know, I practice the, the 12 step program. So I do the third, seventh and 10th step prayer and it's getting me right sized. I've been is a great way to start my day. And, you know, one of the reasons why I continue to go to meetings and, and participate 
is because it reminds me of what I already know, right? I mean, I've been to thousands of meetings and right. it reminds me of what I already know. And so uh, getting me back to what my routine is, you know, where my routine is successful is, is setting that tone for the day. Um, what else has everybody been doing? Um, let's see, Judy, Judy Weaver says, you know, Judy, it hadn't even been 48 hours since you posted your retirement. You're already bored. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I agree. Get back to work, get involved in something. I gotta say, we, we I need to, you in recovery. We need, we need people. I gotta say hi to Justin Boyd. He's on here. He's a representative for the state of Arkansas. And so he believes in people in recovery and long-term recovery and shout out to John Kirkley, who's also on here. He's the director of the board of pharmacists and he's a long-term advocate for people like us. And so, uh, Chris, I think it's important that, that when we have state representatives and people from legislation that are watching our show, that, that we let them know that we appreciate them because without them, uh, we don't have any representation in Congress, you know what I mean? And, and that's how we, we get stuff. So I had to say that real quick. I'm like, hi. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And we need, we need uh, recovery at the table when people are making decisions on, on future policies, future laws that come in play uh, yeah. will affect us and impact us in our daily lives. And so everything from being covered under insurance, um, making sure we have a safe place to go when we're seeking recovery, making sure certain things are accessible uh, yeah. or accessible to, to people in, in early recovery and removing those barriers. And so a lot of times, you know, we have people who are um, open to listen and we need to take the opportunities to share our perspective, our lived experience to, to, to create better policy moving forward. And so we have always appreciate, um, you know, folks that are interested in um, helping us see those things through. So um, who knows? Right hey, Jen Schuler. Hey, uh, Jen, while I've got you here, I need some masks. Do we know where to get some masks? Maybe maybe people are viewing, maybe, uh, you know, are wondering where to get some masks. <clears throat> where to get some? I need some. I'll buy them. Yeah, that's good stuff. And hey, Jen, while you're at it, uh, one of the questions that I keep getting uh, from people in recovery is where can they go get the COVID test and the antibody test, right? Because for some reason, a lot of people in recovery, and this may be true, Chris, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people in recovery feel like we've already had COVID-19 and didn't know it. And so how do we go get the antibody test, Jennifer? Uh, and, and, you know, because I want an antibody test. I need to know not just did I have it or do I have it, but have I had it? You know what I mean? I think the, I think the rule of thumb, Jimmy, is if, if you're feeling uh, ill and, you know, you have some of those symptoms, if you don't know what those symptoms are, check our uh, Arkansas Department of Health uh, for, for those symptoms or just do a quick Google search and what, you know, at COVID-19 coronavirus symptoms. And yeah. if you're feeling those, go get tested, go, go get tested. And if you've come in contact with someone who has been uh, directly exposed to someone, you know, wait about 48 hours and then go get tested because a lot of times people are walking around and not knowing they have it. And that's how it's spreading in the community. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of misinformation going on with uh, the coronavirus and I uh, encourage uh, everybody to uh, visit our Arkansas Department of Health to stay informed um, with what's going on. Um, you can't always believe a meme that you see on Facebook, right? Right. It's true. It's very, very true. But we just got to stay diligent and make sure that uh, we're getting the facts. Carrie said, we put Carrie up on there. She's She's being vulnerable with us and we always appreciate transparency. She's having a rough time and I want uh, others to be able to chime in and help. I don't know if you see it yet, do you? Why does he need to get in? Sorry about that. Do you do you see Carrie? Uh, Carrie Odom. Yeah, I do. I see Carrie Odom. She said She's, good morning. Uh, go to the next one. 
Awesome. I've had a bad week. There we go. Yeah. Will you read? I can't see all of it. Will you help me read it? it says I've had a bad week where I've had a mentor relapse and an overdose. And he had a four, he had 14 years of recovery and also had a seven year cousin, seven year old cousin died in an ATV accident. Wow. That's really tough. Carrie, uh, first and foremost, um, thank you for sharing that and having the courage to do so. Um, I'm with Nicole. We'll be definitely praying for uh, you and your family. That's very, very difficult. And, you know, it's kind of like you're, you're going through life, you're in recovery, you're taking all the um, necessary steps to maintain recovery and, you know, feeling good. And yeah, we, we all have fears and we all have certain things that uh, we worry about. Uh, but it seems like those types of things just blindside us. And, and we're, we're definitely not ready, like, especially with the, your seven year old cousin, those things we're not prepared for and they just smack the crap out of you. And so we're, we're, uh, we're dedicated to hear that you're going through that, but know that you're not alone and we're here to wrap virtual arms around you. Um, and so thank you for, for, for sharing that because that's how you, that's how you get out of yourself. Right, Jimmy, that's how you, uh, you know, take some of that, pain and share it with us so we can, um, you know, you know, carry the load with you. That's right. Pain shared is pain lessened. Uh, I don't care if you stubbed your toe. <laughs> I don't care uh, if it's emotional stress. I don't care if it's tragedy. Like, like we don't have to, we don't have to endure it or bear that pain alone. So uh, we love you, Carrie, and we're here for you. And uh, there's 23 people in the chat room right now. So that's 23 people that can help you carry that. And so uh, I, I'm standing with Chris on that, you know, reach out, inbox the people on here. These are regular people that are always here in the show and, and they're here because they are in long-term recovery and they want to help people in recovery. And, you know, I, I get to emailing them, getting phone numbers, calling them, leaning on them for support. That's what we do. So Jimmy, um, the return to use the the person who had 14 years in recovery that you know i'm i'm in my 13th year this year and so that kind of hits close to home it just is a reminder that i'm not immune i'm not immune to going right. to use it's it's something that uh, i think is is um misunderstood sometimes um right. There are certain things that I'm radical about. I'm an extremist when it comes to me going to a party where the number one priority of the party is to get drunk or get high. Like I just don't do that kind of, I put myself in that kind of situation. Um, but it doesn't, you know, I haven't been, I haven't been sober where I can just coast, you know, yeah. like for the rest of my life. That, that, that's the, I think the thing, like, uh, that that is misunderstood sometimes it's like you get this certain amount of time and then you know the dean of recovery comes and confers you, you your certificate of completion this is an ongoing process and i can either start slipping you know it, you've heard of you're either growing or you're going right yeah yeah so, um let's let's talk a little bit about that because right now um in this in this time you know we just she just said a person in four, with 14 years OD. I mean, it's not like you, you can see the progression is swift. It's quick. I mean, it doesn't yeah. waste time. This person had 14 years of recovery. Yeah. And then boom, it, it's and, not like. It's, and she said, Chris, she also said it wasn't just a person with 14 years. This person was a mentor. So that tells you that this person had some, you know, esteemable things going on in life. If you're in a position uh, a promise, right? And you're mentoring and helping shape other people like that speaks to your character. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're not in self-will really. You're, you're being of service to other people. And so that's scary, you know? And, and I also agree with you. I think somewhere along the line, when that happens, we've gotten off the basics and we, you know, we, you know, if you stay on the basics, you never have to get back to them. But it's very hard to do that over long periods of time. Like you had to reel me in a couple of weeks ago, bro, because I was struggling, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the the deal, right? I mean, it's it's understanding that, you know, the the that. Uh, you know, there's two things that are non-negotiable for me. Yeah. 
if I try to, if I'm talking, if I'm having a self dial, uh, a self conversation, these things are not negotiable. So meeting attendance, not negotiable. I've got to stay close contact with uh, people in the fellowship. Right. And, and then, you know, for, for, yeah. for people though, Chris, that don't do 12 step, right? Like there are a lot of people that don't do 12 step. They like, need the recovery community. They need yeah. somebody in their right. corner. So to, to speak to the point that Chris is making, I don't want you guys to think that we're one track minded or we're only embracing one pathway of recovery. That's not what we do here. Uh, but it's, and it ties into what Nicole's saying right there. Like if you're in recovery, you get a daily reprieve, right? But you got to pay that rent every single day. So what that means is you have to do something to maintain your recovery, whatever your pathway is every day. If your pathway is yoga and church, then you need to be stretching and praying every day. If it's 12 steps, you need to be in a meeting every day. If it's uh, physical exercise, you need to exercise every day, like whatever it is. If it's natural recovery, then you need your natural community. Um, what happens if you don't take action? So I've heard it. I've heard it said like this, Jimmy, it's, it, recovery is kind of like walking up a down escalator. So. I'm walking up, I'm making progress, but if I stop, what happens? Uh-oh. Yeah, you're just going down, right? Like, here's the deal, Chris. I suffer from the disease of addiction. I'm living in long-term recovery despite that, that disease, right? And so not trying to get in a debate about whether addiction's a disease or not. If you're not a leading medical doctor who can speak to neurotransmitters and and dopamine and serotonin release, then I don't want to hear about it, right? But the leading minds of America and the globe, including the the, the World Health Order, has, has determined that addiction is a disease, correct? So, right, um, I've got seven days in a week, Chris. If I give four days of that week to recovery, then I've given, I've given the majority of my week to the solution. If I give, if I go four or five days without working on me and my recovery, then the majority of that week went to feeding my addiction. And so I got people inside of me and they're boxing it out. I got addiction and I got recovery. And the one that I feed is the one that's going to win the fight. That's it in a nutshell. I got to get out every day with the get out. or I'll be on the phone with you talking about somebody's fixing to get me, Chris. Who, who was going to get you? Jimmy McGill. He was coming. He was on my butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. It's good. Let's see what Taylor says. Joseph Cruz says is making masks with filters on them. Ah, not sure where that came in. I've got one with a filter. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. So it's kind of neat. I'm glad he said that. So you get these masks. Mine, Detroit Lions. Someone was mean to me. I was wearing this at the store the other day, and they said, "Hey, you're you're definitely safe from uh, COVID nineteen because you're not going to catch anything wearing that mask." <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what they meant was Detroit's never won a Super Bowl. So, anyway, but you can you can put a filter inside of it. So it's kind right. of it uh, it goes a little bit further than just protecting uh, others. It can protect me a little bit at that point. So. Welcome to Stacy and Paula. What what did Brett Brett just say? Yeah. What is this? Brett said since COVID-19, people who didn't think they have mental issues are seeing what isolation can do to the mind without access to the recovery community. Uh yeah, I'm one of them. I never thought that I would battle with mental health stuff the way I've recently did. <laughs> And according to licensed LCSW that we had on the show last week, I experienced a panic attack, anxiety attack, and high, uh, high signs of major depression. And I've never had nothing like that happen, Chris. No, it's, uh, we're, you know, I wrote this article for the Democrat Gazette that talked about, you know, America was battling a public health crisis right before the coronavirus hit and it in that crisis is addictive. um we have you know the the opioid epidemic coupled with you know just any substance you know people are people are um using substances to try to deal with what's going on and then you add an isolation 
and you know you cut resources off there's um treatment centers closing down you can't see your doctor right things completely stopped and you have people that are cooped up isolated and they're you know you take you take resources available and you know sometimes the only resource available to someone is a substance or you know so just something to stop how they feel and then, you know you end up crossing a line and uh, and it turns into uh, something that becomes unmanageable something that you know where I can't get off the ride and um, and so th that, that's what we're dealing with and it's yeah. it's difficult to I mean I attended a funeral from a person who died of an overdose uh, that I knew and he was a friend of mine um had had big plans for the future i helped him on a resume and he was getting ready to go apply for these jobs and start a career and um you know the 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 pandemic hit and quarantine couldn't go to meetings anymore and it really took a toll on him um and fortunately he didn't make it and so th these are real real these are not cosmetic problems jimmy these are real issues people are people don't have people are losing jobs People are, um, you know, just just left with <clears throat> nothing. And so um, I'm grateful that everybody in here has come together to create this kind of refuge uh, for people to that, that, that haven't dealt with addiction or because because Brett talked about, um, you know, during this time, people don't know what exists, don't know what's out there to, to seek help. And so things like the recovery clinic and other uh, programs that have transitioned online are making resources available for people. Uh, and yeah. dots. I've been in a lot of meetings, Jimmy online. And, you know, at the beginning of the meeting, they say, um, you know, to check in, who are you? If you're new and there are people, I didn't even realize, I didn't even think about this, but since March till now, people that are coming into the recovery community that has, have never even experienced uh, recovery. Yeah. Only exposure yeah. is an online zoom meeting, bro. Yeah. No hugs. No. And no, you know, no handshaking. No. Well, I mean, it's crazy. Like I can't imagine trying to get clean uh, through zoom. You know what I mean? Like, and, and people are, I mean, it's very inspiring and admirable that people are taking up and they just, you know, well, it shows you that level of desperation, you know, yep. and, and also, you know, you know, one good thing that COVID has done to the recovery community for a long time, people have been very prehistoric with recovery. And so it's been a non, a, a, you know, an, an anonymity and a being anonymous. And so one thing COVID has done has forced a lot of people's hand to open their minds up about people like you and I, Chris, people who have been noisemakers and refuse to shut up about recovery. Like, and I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. And you're just like I am. I have looked up time and time again and seen you on the steps of the Capitol or somewhere sharing your recovery. And so I'm sure that there have been people in your fellowship that have bashed you for that because they don't understand. Right. Like this is not about a particular thing. This is about showing the world that recovery is real. It is. It exists. You don't have to die from addiction. And so COVID-19 has brought a lot of people out of the silent stage because they haven't had a choice, but to put recovery out there publicly on the internet. Yeah. And, and I, when I'm sharing from that platform, I don't really share, I, I speak in general, so I don't talk about yeah. what I do personally. I just talk about, you know, the, the, miracle of recovery and the gift yeah. like, i mean some people um and and i was one of those people i was a one track person like i i was really uh you know this way is the only way and um over the course of time i've just you know been my mind's been opened more and more and more and you know, I don't know. I, I had to pop my own bubble, I guess, and go experience um, the world outside of that and, and yeah. learn to get into the literature and get into the, the research and get into the science, get into um, what's going on in the world of addiction medicine. Yeah. 
Um, and I think it comes down to a personal choice. Do I want to, do I want to seek out, do I want to go see if there are, um, things that I didn't understand before? Do I want to learn about those things? Yeah. You know, and so, and it's not just people like me and you, it's not just people in recovery. My hat goes off to people, the moms like Paula Cunningham, Gina Aguilar, Stacy James, right? Like if you look at all their children, right? Like if you look at Hagen's Army and the Matt Adams Foundation and you look at the Parker Gill Foundation, right? Like these are people who lost someone to the disease from an overdose and they took that pain and they turned it into purpose and they hit the gas and they never looked back, bro. Like, and so when I see a mom standing at the podium a year after losing their kid to a drug overdose, I don't, ha I don't understand how people in recovery everywhere don't do what, what you and I do. Why are, why are the people who are standing out screaming, you never have to use again. So few, why is there only a handful of us in every state? Like, do you not see these mamas? Do you, are you not tired of standing in the hospital rooms and burying people like Clint and Tanner Harvey? Like, are you not tired of, you know, seeing people wake up in a car from an overdose with police knocking on their windows? You know, I, I mean, why are y'all shut up about it? Like, speak up, stop contributing because uh, silence is, is, you know, I don't know. I get fired up about that. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And I think uh, I can share some perspective on that. Uh, and it comes down to stigma. And it's because a, a lot of um, we haven't been able to normalize the conversation around addiction. And it's still, like you said, hush, hush in a lot of places. I think that, um, you know, the, the ever, you know, as generations to experiment with drugs and alcohol um those people are just being introduced uh to the world of uh the the substance use disorder if it, it it turns into that and so if 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 i'm that parent and i'm in this community if the stigma still exists it's going to be very hard for me to and so we must continue to normalize the conversation around addiction and, and, and we can do that through storytelling Yeah. and how we felt, how we felt distant, how we felt shame, how we felt like we couldn't say anything. Yeah. Because we we're afraid to be ridiculed um, and looked down upon. And so uh, not only the person who's afflicted with active addiction, but the family too. I mean, Paula shares this powerful story where her own family you know, stigmatized what was going on. Um, and, and so it's, it's, we got a lot of work to do. Um, uh, but I agree with you that, you know, the, we just, we keep talking, um, in, in hopes that someone else will be able to you know, join the conversation and then someone else will join the conversation and someone else. And then, um, we're talking about, uh, the gift of recovery and how it is shaping um, our lives. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about the lighthouse, right? You, you know, we want to be a lighthouse because there are people that uh, are, are in the harbor in the dark and they don't know where the land is. They don't know right. how to shore and they're in pain and, and they're wanting to come home. And so uh, we need as many lighthouses as we can get. Yeah. Sure. What I was going to say too is, is um, when I was in higher education administration, I really, I, I mean, I, I shared my recovery story on an as, I, I, this is where I was coming from as an as needed basis. So when I was dealing with a student that, um, you know, talked about some history of, of uh, substance use, you know, then I would, you know, talk about mine. Yeah. So, I wasn't I wasn't speaking as openly as I was today. And part of that was because I was afraid it would impact my career. And I was wrong. I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. So I know a lot of people with 25 and 30 years that have very promising and prominent careers, Chris. And they remain in the shadows because, uh, you know, 
they're CEOs and they, and that's the stigma, right? Like if you're scared to say you're in recovery, then we're still fighting stigma. You know what I mean? Like that's the freaking, that's the problem. You shouldn't be afraid to say, yeah, I've worked here and I'm the CEO of this hospital or whatever. And are up in the board or, or however far up the career ladder you go. And yeah, I suffer from addiction. You know what? You might change perceptions. You know, sooner or later, we have to quit being scared of what other people think and do what's right. You know, we don't understand how widespread addiction is, right? Right. You know, it, it's, it's one of those weird deals where it hits your family. You feel like you're the only one that's dealing with it. And then when you share and say, hey, I'm struggling with this, you know, everybody. Like, yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the club. We all yeah, are. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when I was at uh, the the system office here in in, in uh, Little Rock, I had an opportunity to help somebody's uh, child get into uh, detox. Yeah. I had to break my anonymity. Right. And I was really scared of doing that. And then I and I wake up the next morning to an email and the the president of the system is copied on this email and it's talking about how I shared my past and, you know, thanking me for, you know, helping uh, in mm -hmm. that situation. And it outed me. I mean, I was out and um, I was so scared. Yeah, it's going to happen. But guess what happened? Other people started reaching out and saying, hey. I uh, I heard that uh, this happened, and can you help me and 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 my family? I've got this issue that we we uh, need help and, and guidance on, and that's when I really started speaking out more and and really not uh, you know starting to like put my faith in that process of of walking that path um, because I mean the top I I mean I don't know um, I was just. At the same time, I was tired of my friends and community members dying, too. All right. And what I was doing wasn't really working, so I just decided to try something different. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I feel like this has been a really good show, Chris. It's been like a it's been a serious one, right? It's been a yeah, yeah. yeah, we got fired up, man. Uh, do you have any closing updates? I know we wanted to do a 30 minute show and so I've got to get to the office. I think you had an update. Share it with us. I do. A uh, couple of them. Oh, uh, if you are on medically assisted treatment or medically assisted recovery, there is a new medication mode. assisted. Sorry. Yeah, there is a brand new uh, Mara meeting called Mara Rocks. It's for medically assisted recovery anonymous. I don't care, Chris. <laughs> Medication. Medication assisted recovery anonymous, and it meets every first and third Friday, uh, 11 21 9 Financial Center Parkway, suite number 200 in Little Rock, Arkansas. So, you know, we know that if you're on MAT, uh, people in the 12 step community, they have always been judgmental. They always kind of feel like it's an abstinence based. Uh, program and so it, you can often feel judged and looked down on and so now you guys have your own meeting and it's amazing and I'm I'm happy to see it Texas has been doing it for a long time and there's Jen chiming right in behind Chris my oh what's up Paula my grammar teachers <laughs> so anyway yeah that's it and oh um uh Recovery Awareness Day. Yes, it's August a big one. This is a big one. Yeah, August 15th at Indian Head Lakes, right? Like we know that the recovery community has been suffering. We've been torn apart by COVID. Uh, we found a way to bring our community together and safely social distance. All Arkansas Department of Health guidelines will be enforced. We're checking temperatures and screening and contact tracing. And the lake's big enough for 20,000 people to safely, say, safely stay uh Boy, you and Jennifer will be on me about that, won't you? Safely. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> anyway, <Nope>. uh, <laughs> so you guys can literally stay like 15 feet away from each other. We got live bands. Uh, but here's the cool part. Sheriff John Staley and Brett Franks, the peer specialist for Lone Oak County Jail, will actually be doing the packed 
peer recovery program graduation. There are 12 men who are going to get their uh, graduation certificate on stage in between speakers. Uh, it's going to be great. I'm going to speak actually for about 30 minutes. So if you want to come hang out with me and uh, we are still looking for other speakers, Chris. So you should send us a one minute clip, Chris, of you sharing your story so the board of directors can vote on these speakers. Uh, we'd love to hear you guys. Uh, we got Kish Moody playing Present Crisis. We got Capture the Flag with Water Balloons. It's freaking off the chain. It's going to be fun, amazing, and safe. And we that's got really, a That's really heartwarming, though, that um, they're going to be able to graduate and be a part of this big event. What a great way to introduce them to recovery in a big way like that. All right. Yeah, absolutely. So... All right. Gary, well, you're in Florida. You better stay safe, girl. Yeah. Hot spot. Hey, uh, do you have anything else, Chris? I just want to say thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we we totally just in love with all of you, and we're so glad to be a part of this team, uh, the dream team of recovery. And so keep doing it and reach us throughout the week. If you have any uh, topics you want to hear, if you have any uh, comments that you'd like us to cover, um, email us yeah just just uh, put a message into the recovery clinic we'll, we'll uh, touch base on that awesome well all right chris i will see you next wednesday at 11 is that right Peace. Peace. all right bye guys enjoy bye. the show